On January 2010, Jeff Miller, an independent businessman from Rogers Park, Illinois, earned his third consecutive ultimate couch potato title. <laughs> Watching Chicago's ESPN Zone, he said, it's all about determination. <laughs> After watching the sports program for 70, 72 hours, not sleeping, Miller, who's 26 years old, beat three other competitors, all men, by the way, <laughs> and pushed himself beyond the Guinness World Record for nonstop viewing of the ESPN's TV marathon, um, according to their rules of no sleeping, no leaving the chair, except for three times a day for bathroom breaks and every hour to get up for a five minute stretch. And so the actual viewing, the remote control was controlled by the people that ran the contest, which is hard enough for a guy, right? 72 hours later, Miller was the last man sitting. <laughs> His superior sluggish, sluggishness earned him a brand new recliner a $1,000 gift card towards a new television, money for one year of his cable bill, $1,000 in ESPN's own credit, and the ultimate couch potato trophy that has a real potato. His girlfriend was very proud. <laughs> Notice, girlfriend, not wife. Uh, she said, most people have no idea what it takes to win. They don't understand the endurance it takes to stay awake and control bodily issues. Jeff is uniquely qualified. He's an expert. <laughs> Quite a thing to be proud of, right? Funny when we become heroes at useless things. But sometimes we have to admit in our lives, we find ourselves pursuing useless things. And not only pursuing it, but investing in it more than we should. In today's passage, we find Christ bringing us back to sanity, sobriety with our view of how we invest our lives. And so in verse 11 of chapter 19, we see that Jesus entrusts us with each of us with the same amount now let's check out this parable, this story that veils the heavenly truth with earthly pictures. As they heard these things, and so this is as Zacchaeus comes to the Lord and gives his life to Jesus, um, he proceeded to tell a parable to all the people that were there watching and following him as they were on their way because he was near to Jerusalem. And because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Now this concludes the, the travel narrative that if you're following the book of Luke, it began in chapter 9, verse 51. So for 10 chapters, we've been following Christ on his journey to Jerusalem and this is the last thing before he reaches Jerusalem. And so it sets the stage for the triumphal entry of the king. And we learned last week that Jesus is the son of David, the king, who was promised that one of his descendants would reign forever uh, from David's throne. He would rule in an everlasting kingdom. Christ being of the root of Jesse, or the root of the stump of Jesse, the picture of a tree cut down, the line, the kingly line of Israel, looking as if it had been cut off, but here comes this shoot, according to prophecy, um, out from under the ground, and a king arrives. And so this crowd that is on its way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, and the crowd, mind you, just grows over time as um, some 
started trickling down from the north of Israel and toward Jerusalem, and people started joining this caravan of folks and to be near Jesus, to hear his teaching, to witness the miracles, they were getting really excited because they were expecting a king, Jesus, to start his kingdom when they got to Jerusalem. And so there's this energy in the crowd, an expectation. And perhaps even in their minds, some of the prophecies, like in Zechariah 14, that something amazing would happen. They've already seen miracles, but now they're maybe expecting these supernatural events. Like in Zechariah 14, verse 4, On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward, northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountain, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azel. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost, and there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day or night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. That's what they were expecting. Something supernatural, not only that he would conquer the Romans and kick them out of the promised land, but the, these things would occur. People could sense a climax coming, but it was a climax of a different kind, as we'll see. That day is yet to come. The disciples, even after the resurrection, had the expectation that the kingdom would come immediately. In Acts 1, verses 6 through 7, it says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And so we find there would be a delay in his return. And so he talks about in the meantime, he'll send his spirit and we'll be witnesses throughout the world. And then he ascends to heaven. Check this out in verse 8 of at Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, and in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight while they were gazing into heaven. As he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And so now we wait. And we don't know the day or the hour, but we know that he will come like a thief in the night. And when he does return, he will touch down on the Mount of Olives, splitting it in two, setting up his kingdom. But until that happens, we're entrusted with the stewardship of his belongings here on earth. And so we live now in this time, this in-between time, between the ascension and his return. And so that's why Jesus told this parable, because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately, but no, it is not. And so we wait. And in Scripture encourages us, don't get discouraged because with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. He will fulfill his promises as he has throughout all of human history. And so the parable, to prepare us for this in-between time when we're entrusted with his belongings, it says, 
He said, therefore, a noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Now, what misses the, the modern-day reader in, in this verse is something that would have hit between the eyes of those who read it in that day. Because there was a historical parallel, a news headline that everybody was familiar with historically, that Herod the Great received his kingdom by going to Rome, where the emperor appointed him as king in Israel. He then returned to the land as king with the authority of Rome. He went to a far country, came back as king. Now, before he died, Herod named his son Archelaus, his successor. Out of all of Herod's son, Herod Archelaus had the worst reputation of them all. So like Herod, he went to Rome to have his inheritance approved by the emperor, to be appointed king in a distant country and then return. But not wanting him to be their ruler, the Jews and the Samaritans, they sent a delegation to argue their case before Caesar, that they didn't want this guy. And so Caesar, after hearing not only the opposition case from the Jews and Samaritans, but even Archelaus' own family members, decided to only give him half the kingdom. And named him ethnarch of Judea instead of king in Israel. Now this guy was guilty of great cruelty and oppression. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that he put to death 3,000 Jews in the temple not long after his appointment to show that he was in charge and he would be um, a man of power. But eventually, Because of his bad rule, he was banished to Gaul, where he died. So imagine, in the minds of the people, they know this story. It sounds familiar, just like Archelaus. Yeah, Archelaus. In verse 13, calling 10 of his servants, he gave them 10 minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Now, as we look at the story, the noble man corresponds to, in this case, Jesus Christ, the son of David, who goes to the father after his ascension and all authority is placed under his feet. Scripture tells us about this. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Christ is in a distant country with the Father in heaven, has been given authority and made king, and now we await his return. So the nobleman is Christ. Then we see a couple of other groups here. First, the nobleman's servants, which corresponds to believers in Christ, those who follow Jesus and make him their king. Uh, We are his servants. And the king entrusts these servants with 10 minas. Um, Might sound strange to us today, but it's a Greek monetary unit worth 1 16th of a talent. Sounds familiar now, right? I'm just kidding. A mina is equal to 100 drachmas, which is 100 days wages. So about three months of wages for the common worker. That's how much one mina is worth. Now, don't confuse this with the parable of the talents that you find in Matthew 25, because um, a talent is uh, 
16 times greater than Amina. And in the case of that parable, each servant is given a differing value. Some are given more talents and others less. And that's actually where we get our word today, talented. Uh, if somebody is very talented, they have more talent given to them. So a talent to this large sum of money is used in that other parable to describe a talented person entrusted by God with great things or lesser things. But in this parable, notice, everybody is given the exact same amount. So it's not a matter of talent or gifts in this parable, but one of faithfulness and investment. So every Christian has been entrusted with the same amount of blessing. And we'll break it down a little bit more in a little bit. But every Christian has been entrusted with the same amount. The same amount as Peter. The same amount as Paul and Billy Graham. And any other spiritual hero you can think of. We've all been entrusted with the same amount. And so until Christ comes, we're to take that and invest our lives and engage in business until Christ returns. And so the clear purpose here is stewardship. A servant is being tested to see if they're fit for larger tasks, for larger authority. And so today as we invest our life, living out our faith and sharing Christ, it will have an impact on our eternal state in the future. Now, the other group that we see here, first we looked at the servants, and then there are the citizens, which corresponds to the religious leaders of Christ's day that rejected him, Israel in general as a nation who rejected Christ, and even up to today, the rebellious world that rejects Jesus, the citizens that hate him and say, we don't want him as our king. In John 1, 10 through 11, it says he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. And so we see the citizens that you would think would receive him as king, reject him. They even send a delegation to oppose him. And so, when he goes to the far country, he's made king. In verse 15, we see that he returns. Verses 15 through 27, we see Jesus will return and he will reward faithfulness. So let's look at this. It says, when he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in very little. You shall have authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, you are to be over five cities. The first two servants were productive for the king. They were commended. The first one made 1,000% on his investment. That's pretty good. That's the guy you want to give your money for your retirement account, right? The other guy made 500%, which is still amazing. When Christ returns, he will be looking for that investment in our lives, that he would reward those who have been faithful which, with which they've been entrusted with. There is a time when we will give an accounting as servants of Christ, as believers in the Lord. And this accounting or judgment will occur at what's called the Bema Seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, for we must all appear before the Bema Seat of Christ. The word judgment there in the Greek is Bema. We'll talk about what that means in a, in a second. 
so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So the Bema Seat judgment, the one at which believers will stand before the Lord and give an account. This idea of a Bema Seat, it's the Greek word that comes from the word for steps. And so the picture is a throne that is at the top of a set of steps. It always reminds me of when we went to the Seattle Underground. Anybody ever been to the Seattle Underground? It's so cool, you know, going down there, kind of creepy and dark and dirty. I don't know what it's like these days, but uh, that was like when I was in high school. And I never get out of my mind the picture of the toilet seat at the top of a set of steps. Because of the tide coming in, they had to like bring the uh, toilet seats higher. <laughs> anyway, that's kind of what it looked like, but it was a throne, a real throne. Not the porcelain one. <laughs> this was a common picture in that day, thrown with steps leading up to it in major cities in which a ruler would sit. And there's an archaeological example where Herod built a structure resembling a throne at Caesarea from which he viewed the games like the Olympic Games, and made speeches to people. It was there he would sit, and the victors, the athletes that won, would ascend the steps to the throne and receive the victor's crown, or the wreath. That is the picture of the judgment that we face as believers. We will give an account. We'll come to the Bema Seat, and we'll see how we ran the race. Some will suffer loss. Some will receive reward. It's not an issue of salvation. The Bema Seat is not a judgment unto hell. It's one of rewards. There is another judgment unto hell, and that is the great white throne judgment. And we'll, you can read about it in the book of Revelation. We'll talk about that in a second too. But... We're rewarded in response to our faithfulness and productivity with how we live our lives now for Jesus Christ. Notice the disproportionate reward for the service rendered. It's pretty crazy, right? You take some money and make interest on it or um, an investment with some good return. And in return, instead of being given more money, these guys are given a greater reward, authority over cities, a far greater responsibility, completely disproportionate to what you would expect. The rewards that we receive from Christ on that day from the Bema seat will be completely disproportionate to what we deserve. It'll be completely beyond anything you could imagine. Treasures in heaven, in the real kind of treasure, not of gold and silver and diamonds, but eternal treasures. Part of that is ruling and reigning with Christ and how it will all look one day, who knows, but it sounds exciting. The greatest thing is to hear him say, well done, faithful servant. In verse 20, then another came saying, Lord, here's your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. Now, if you were the king, that would be not the best thing to hear. Like, ouch, man. Severe? What are you talking about? It's the idea of being strict or exacting. Morris notes that it's a man who expects to get blood out of a stone. Now this guy, I believe, had the wrong view of the king. Wrong theology leads to wrong living. A.W. Tozer said this, nothing twists and deforms the soul more than a low or unworthy conception of God. When we don't understand the grace of God, 
um, it messes us up big time, you know? Either if we try to abuse his grace by saying, oh, God will forgive me anyway and just living in rebellion. Or if we don't understand his grace of forgiveness and we live a legalistic life. When we don't understand the grace of God, his love, his character, and also his righteousness and holiness, then we get all twisted up. This guy, because of the way he viewed the king, did absolutely nothing with that which he was entrusted with. He was afraid that if he suffered loss, he would have to make it all up. He would get in trouble and all this stuff. And so he suffered what we call the paralysis of analysis. He just couldn't get out of his head, worrying and thinking about what if this, what if that. Or maybe he was just lazy. I like what Kent Hughes says. He says, the sor this sorry Christian slanders God in his heart and hoards what he has received from Christ. He carefully folds it into a cloth and stores it away. He thinks, I can't be active, but I can at least be conservative if I can preserve the Christian tradition. If I can submit to a church wedding and send my children to Sunday school, I can take a Christian point of view, I can wrap up my religion in my handkerchief and conserve it. To live in such a way that it would not transform every part of your life. The lack of investment of your life for the kingdom of God. And so the king is not pleased. In verse 22, he said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow? Why then? Did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might receive or have collected it with interest. Notice he condemns him according to his own words because he supposes that the master is severe. And so the master says, okay, I'll just take you at your word of how you see me and judge you accordingly. If you thought I was so severe, why did you not at least put it in the bank so that there was interest? So either you're lying or you're just so twisted up by the analysis of paralysis. Paralysis of analysis, there you go. <laughs> so he was even more condemned for not doing something than for failing at trying. That would have been better than not trying at all. And that's why he's called the wicked servant. This wicked servant um, misrepresented his master, acted self-servingly, didn't do what he know, knew that he should do. In James 4, 17, it says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. When God makes it clear what he's called us to, and through this parable, it's clear, invest your life in his kingdom. This guy should have at least banked the money. Now, they didn't have banks as in our idea of bank, but rather the Greek word here means on the table, um, the table of the money lender. Our word bank actually comes from this word bench, the money lenders bench. It was a low risk investment where the king would have earned money with a little bit of interest. But this guy proved that he was not trustworthy because he didn't even take the safe route. In verse 24, and he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has 10 minus. I tell you that everyone who has more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is an amazing kingdom principle that those who are faithful with little will be entrusted with much. If we prove ourselves unfaithful, then even what we have is taken away. 
Now, this is not some teaching that the rich will get richer, but that those who are trustworthy will receive more authority. They will, they will be entrusted with more things of the kingdom, more things of heaven. If you want to experience promotion in the kingdom of God, it comes not by kissing up to the right church leaders. <laughs> it comes by being faithful in the things God has given you um, and serving for him to see. And he has a way of promoting and blessing and, and doing things through you and in you that no church could um, put a title on you and you wouldn't be able to experience the promotion of the Lord except through serving for him. So this last servant is not an outright enemy, but a disobedient believer. He wastes his opportunities. He loses the reward. In 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, there's a picture of somebody who does this. It says, now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So the foundation is the gospel, and the way we love our lives is the way in which we build this structure. And we can choose to invest for the kingdom, building our lives with gold, silver, costly stones, so that one day when we stand before Christ and he judges us by setting that structure on fire, what's left? If we build like the couch potato guy, becoming heroes and useless things, <laughs> our lives being built out of wood, hay, and straw, and it's set alight, what's left? Will we enter heaven smelling like smoke? Whew, barely made it, but I'm here, guys. You know, or will we enter as heroes of the kingdom? In verse 27, the last verse, it says, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Always love hearing a nice story at church. <laughs> Warm fuzzies. We go from the Bema Seat judgment to now what corresponds to the great white throne judgment. This grim imagery of the fact that those who reject Christ face eternal destruction. The way that we respond to Jesus is a matter of life and death. The decision of how you respond to Jesus will have an eternal impact. So where are you at with Jesus today? When it comes to this, there's only two types of people in the world. There's either servants or believers in Jesus, or there's the rebellious citizens or those that reject Christ. There are some that reject Christ that are still in their minds friendly towards him. Oh, he's a good teacher. You know, he's a neat rabbi. But the claims that Christ makes cannot be denied. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Only one way. There's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved, Acts 4.12. One day when he does return, he will divide and separate his people from the world. In Revelation 19, verse 17, he'll deal with the world, those who are on the face of the earth. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. 
Come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both slave and free, both small and great. So this gruesome picture might sound horrible, and that is the way that a lot of kings have ruled throughout the centuries. The end times will be far worse. Well, the parable of living an invested life. I want to conclude with sharing with you guys. I know that over uh, the course of a lot of time, um, I'm kind of decompressing some of those lessons I've learned over the last year. And you probably will hear about them for a while. So sorry if you get sick of hearing about me going through the cancer treatment, bone marrow transplant, and all that stuff. Um, it's less than a year ago. It'll be a year at the end of next month that I got my stem cells, um, which is pretty cool. It's coming up. But I learned a lot of lessons during that time. And one of the things that stuck out to me on a somewhat regular basis once I stepped away from church at the end of last January and was in the hospital, um, was thinking, will I ever preach again? Will I ever see people at church again? <laughs> will I have an opportunity to do ministry again? And thinking, well, I hope that what I've done so far with my life is something that I can enter eternity being okay with, you know, that I would be ready, that I would say, you know what, I ran the race, I fought the fight. And so the thought, well, what if I get better and go back to ministry? What would I do? Would I do it differently? Would I become, you know, much more uh, intense or, you know, what? I don't know, but I don't even know if I'm going to make it back. In Ecclesiastes 11, verses 1 through 4, during those thoughts and praying about those things, God used this passage to kind of stir me up on the inside. It said, cast your bread upon the waters, for you know you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if tree, a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, but I just want to simply explain this passage and how it impacted my heart. And, and that is, you know, the, the idea of casting your bread upon the waters is the idea of that which you give will return to you in some form, you know. Um, whether it be the idea of investing in maritime business and uh, all the ships going out and then getting things from all over the world and coming back and you make money, um, as a lot of traders did in that day. But the Jews understood it as giving to the poor, and then at some point, goodness would come back. It's a great principle to invest your life in something so that there is something to show that you are here, that God had entrusted you with something, and that you prove faithful. When I read that passage, it kind of reminds me of my dog, Lovey. Here's a picture of her. She's looking out over the water. We lived on the water for like two years. We rented a house down there in Gig Harbor and she understood this principle because she would drop her toy over the railing there and it would fall into the water. And for days you would see her toy floating out there. You know, 
This bright orange ball, just going in with the tide, going out with the tide, thinking, will we ever see it again? I don't know. So we buy her a new one. And so she's playing with the new one, and then one day the tide comes in, and then it goes out, and it leaves behind her other ball. Now she's got two. <laughs> My dog gets it. Cast your bread upon the water, and something is going to happen with it. You know, God will multiply because he's that loving master who gets us another ball and then we cast it out on the water and then he blesses us even more. Gospel investment requires action, but oftentimes we find ourselves making excuses and it keeps us from doing what we know we should do. That's why at the end of this it says, he who observes the wind will not sow and he who regards the clouds will not reap. It's the idea of saying, hmm, you know, it looks pretty windy out there this morning. Or, you know, it looks like it's going to rain. I think I'll just stay inside. The Proverbs talks about the slug, sluggard. He says, ooh, there's a lion in the streets. And that's his justification for staying at home and laying in bed. You don't want to go out and get eaten by a lion. But how many people are getting eaten by lions, you know? It's just not happening out there. And so maybe that's the thing that's keeping you from investing your life is it's so easy. It's such a part of our nature to come up with excuses. I'm too busy. You know, I've tried that before and I've only gotten burned or whatever it is. So if we look at what God has entrusted us with, all with the same thing, equally, he's entrusted us with the same Holy Spirit which we saw in Acts 1.8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We have all been empowered by the Holy Spirit and we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's there to comfort us and to guide us. He's there to help us be successful in our walk as we're being transformed more into the image of Christ. We've all been entrusted with the same access to the throne through prayer. We've all been given the same access. There is not like a front row area where people give more money and they end up having a closer seat to the throne and more attention by God. Uh, no, the ground is level before the Lord. As we approach him, we are all in the same place. And so in Hebrews 4.16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We all have the same access. Are we going before the Lord in prayer, believing that he's entrusted us with the act of prayer? There are some folks, which I understand now, having been sick, that you can't necessarily run out, even though I was wanting to do more with my life, not sure I was going to be able to. One thing I did learn how to do is pray because that's all I could do. But I can't help but to wonder if that is one of the best investments you can make to approach the throne of grace and to pray for the people in your life who don't know Jesus Christ, to pray to the Lord and grow close to him. So we've been entrusted with the same Holy Spirit, the same access to the throne through prayer. We've been entrusted with the same Bible. We have the word, all of us do. If you don't know it very well, well, read it and get to know it. If you've had it for years and years and you still don't know it, well, whose fault is that, you know? <laughs> I've been challenged with that in my own life, you know? So many resources, so many things I could grow in and it's up to me to get into the word but also to do what the word says. If you really want to invest the Bible, it's not just knowing it, but it's doing it. And so we make a return on God's investment by responding appropriately. That's why James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Two more things that we've all been entrusted with and then I want to close. 
the gospel, you have been given the antidote to death, the message of life. The purpose for our existence is all within the gospel message. If you've accepted Christ, then you have the answer. You have the antidote. All of us have been entrusted with the same thing. And some people, yeah, they might be more articulate or whatever, but what I have found is that that doesn't matter when you're sharing the gospel because the gospel is inherently powerful on its own. Even if you are weak, the power of the gospel is beyond our understanding. You know, and I can remember hearing a 15-year-old kid from my youth group sharing Jesus with his friend that he brought to youth group. And afterwards, was sharing the, the gospel, really trying, and I was thinking to myself, hmm, you know, he's kind of got it, but he's not really doing the best job in the world. And, uh, you know, silly me, as he shared for a little bit, then his friend was like, I want to become a Christian <laughs> and prayed to receive Christ. And God humbled my heart. You never know how God might use you. If you're not articulate, don't worry about it. <laughs> the power of the gospel, um, you can't deny. But then something we've all been given and we all have the same amount of is time. We have the same amount of minutes in a day, the same amount of hours, same amount of months. How much time we live on this earth is different, but each day we have the same amount of time. How come some people make such a huge impact for the kingdom of God with their time versus others? Well, how do we spend our time? In Ephesians 5, 15, it says, look carefully then how you walk not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. So many things we can get caught up in, trying to be heroes in things that don't matter. Do you spend your time running the race, fighting the fight to stand before the bema seat of Christ and to receive the the wreath, the crown of victory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you entrust us with such amazing things beyond our comprehension and that as we invest our lives, you even bless us with those things. And we bless you by giving a return for that which you've given us. Lord, I do pray that you would point out that area of our life, whether it be sharing the gospel or how we spend our time, our prayer life, our obedience to the word, our dependence on the Holy Spirit, whatever it is that we've all been entrusted with, God, that you would teach us. Give us the motivation. Lord, I pray that you give us the faithfulness and in those areas that we've been self-serving, we repent, Lord. We admit that we've spent our time being heroes of things that don't matter. And Lord, we look for something greater, something where we would hear you say, well done. And if there's anybody in here today that is stirred by knowing responding to Jesus is a matter of life and death, and you want to choose life, that you'd pray this prayer, Lord Jesus, save me, sinner. Thank you for coming to this earth to die for my sin, to pay the price, to become my guilt and shame. And Lord, I receive your righteousness as a gift, as a set of clean clothes to put on over my soiled garments that I might stand before you as holy and acceptable. Help me to live for you and that my life would make a difference for eternity. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.